I'm really excited today because our speaker is amazing. I'm just going to start there. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Michelle Pekansky Brock. Uh, she is one of my favorite leaders in higher education with expertise in online learning, course design, and faculty development. Uh, Michelle's work has helped online instructors across the nation and beyond understand how to craft relevant, humanized online learning experiences that support the diverse needs of college students. Uh, she is the author of Best Practices for Teaching with Emerging Technologies and has received national recognition for her excellence in teaching and faculty development. Uh, she's just a wonderful person to know and follow uh, on, on Twitter and just her work in general. And without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic off to her. Welcome everyone, uh, or welcome Michelle uh, <laughs> to our group today. Thank you so much, Keegan, and the rest of um, the community for welcoming me here today. It's, it's an incredible honor, and I really, really, really mean that um, when I get invitations to come speak with, with different institutions, I get excited, and um, it's just it's a true honor to be here with you today. So um, let me just preface this presentation with a couple of thoughts before I jump right into it, because we only have an hour together today. Um, I am a teacher at heart, and I have been an advocate and a supporter of asynchronous online courses um, for as long as I started teaching online, which that was about 17, 18 years ago. And um, in this presentation, you are going to see a big focus on teaching and a big focus on students. So um, keep that in mind as we move forward. This is not gonna be a presentation that highlights glitzy tools. Um, it's, really about, it's really about people and human connection. So with that said, um, I would first like to just invite you to Click on the chat if you haven't already, and please engage in that chat with each other. I welcome you to share thoughts with each other, share reflections, share resources throughout the presentation. Um, I will tell you right now that I go into cognitive overload, so it's a little hard for me to juggle the chat, but if something does come up that I should address, um, if someone from the the, the team could reach out and let me know. I'll do my very best to do so. But I will use the chat and I'd like to get started. Hi, Laura. I'd like to get started by asking each of you to just take, take a few seconds to think about how you're feeling right now, how you're feeling today, and share two words that describe how you're feeling today in the chat. So in the chat, if you could just share two words to describe how you're feeling today. Thank you. I'm gonna let those, um, those adjectives continue to flow in there and just uh, make some space to recognize that a lot of people are feeling really good. A lot of people are feeling um, as if their cup is flow with over. And a lot of people have kind of um, a mixed bag going on there, which is completely um, normal at this point of where we are uh, with this, this reality we are existing in. Um, I have one more thing that I want you to do before we get into uh, what I'm gonna talk about. I want you to take a few moments now to, to just kind of try to peel yourself away from, from, from where we are with the, the moment upon us with, um, with teaching and everything that's happening in the world and reflect on your own life and identify a time in your life when you did not belong. So again, think about your life and identify one time that you felt like you did not belong. And then by the way, I promise I'm not gonna ask you to share it. That's important to know. This is just for you. And as you filter through those, those memories and you settle upon one, I want you to think about, try to remember the feelings, try to remember the way that that felt for you. 
And I want to recognize that every one of you is thinking about something very different right now. And some of those experiences may be recalling some, some difficult, um, some diff difficult memories, some diff difficult feelings. So I want to acknowledge that and be sure that you give yourself space to process that. I'm going to share a story with you um, about an experience that I had, um, and you'll see how it relates, I promise. <laughs> but about a year and a half ago, before COVID, I went to my 30th high school reunion, and I did not want to go. Um, I spent months with the decision. I waited to the last minute to buy a ticket. I went ahead and I bought one and I was really trying to push myself to just kind of get out of my comfort zone and just go do it. High school was not a fun experience for me. Um, and I was convincing myself that I'm connected with all the people I really care about on Facebook. So why should I go to this thing? And I, I really challenged myself and wanted myself to go. So as that date got closer, um, I could feel myself getting more reluctant and convincing myself that I'd made a mistake and that I didn't, still didn't need to go. So what, you know, maybe I can give my ticket to someone else. Um, I, I did go and the night I got there, I remember walking into the venue and I remember feeling my back get sweaty and I remember feeling my heart start to beat really fast and just being in a place of extreme discomfort. And again, those thoughts of turn around, get out, get back in your car, nobody will know, nobody saw you. And as I was walking up to the, the desk, um, a man came up to me and, and put his hand out and said, hi, Michelle, I'm Andrew Rodriguez, fake name. Um, and I looked at him and I, I spent a little bit of time looking in his face and kind of, you know, okay, 30 years later. And I said, oh gosh, I remember you. We had English together. And so he and I sat there for just maybe two minutes and talked about the past and talked about our memories together and, you know, talked about our teacher. And, um, and then we went our separate ways. And after that moment, I felt so much more settled I felt ready to lean in and I felt ready to just experience the night, which is what I did. At the end of that night, when the crowd was starting to thin, Andrew came back up to me and he said, Michelle, can I get your, your attention for just a minute? And I said, absolutely. What's going on? Did you have a good time? And, and he said, I want you to know that you were the only person here tonight that remembered me. And that meant so much. And Andrew and I leaned in together. <laughs> and honestly, both of us started crying. And we just kind of went to this place of realness. And we started talking about, you know, what high school was for us and how hard it was to get there tonight. And uh, we exchanged numbers and I actually just text him, texted him earlier this week as I was getting ready for this presentation. Um, and as I looked around at the rest of the people, it just made me think how many others felt that same way, right? Um, and it also made me recognize things like the privileges that I have that I didn't have to worry about, right? Um, like I thought about my one uh, black classmate, the one who came to the reunion and what it must, felt, must have felt like for him. And, um, you know, I, there was just so much to unpack there. Um, but as you think about your own experiences and you think about that story I just shared, the reason I'm starting here is because this story really takes us to a place that connects all of us. It's not about teachers or students. It, it, it's about humans. And we all have this need to connect with one another and to belong. We are a social species. The other point of this is to really highlight that social situations are what marginalize or minoritize people. So it's not people, it's our environment. And I, I want us to keep that in mind um, as we move forward. And I'm gonna now start sharing. And while we're talking about this topic, um, just one more thought to, to, to kind of keep in mind that I think is very important. This concept of belonging is not the same as fitting in. When a person needs to fit in, 
They need to change who they are to be something else. Belonging is being accepted for your true authentic self. It's only when a person truly belongs that they can thrive and achieve their full potential. When you exist in an environment that continuously expects you to conform, you're depleting part of your, hum your humanity and it's absolutely exhausting. And this is the effect of living with poverty and or racism. It's more, more and more of your students are coping with this than ever. When we teach online folks, um, we know, I mean, I want to, I'll be the first one to acknowledge that it's very easy. It's, it's so much easier to just simply relate to, to our students as a list of names on a screen. But when we do that, we lean on our assumptions about our students. As Dr. Donna Y. Ford says, the less we know about a person, the more we make up. And the reality is that our students, those students in each class that you teach are much more than names on a screen. They're humans from diverse backgrounds. When they enter your course, each student brings a rich collection of past experiences and perspectives into your class. And we need to design online courses that make spaces for those experiences, all of the experiences, even the ones that, that relate to these negative feelings. Within these experiences, many of our students also bring internal narratives about their own intellectual ability that have been influenced by past microaggressions and negative stereotypes about intellectual ability. Remember, students come with all of their experiences related to education and life in general. Um, these internal narratives can serve as cognitive blockers that shape what students do in your class. One small mistake can be the evidence they're looking for that your class is not a place for them. As the students we serve continue to become more diverse, so do the needs they bring into your classroom. And this is not a problem that a shiny new ed tech tool can solve. The antidote for this problem, one of the antidotes for this problem lies in human connection and in teaching. Now, I find it really interesting in higher education um, when we really kind of delve into this topic of emotions, because I find that in general, it makes many educators uncomfortable. It's kind of like, it's that sticky place. It's that sticky, squishy place, the soft place where we don't go, right? In higher education, it's college. You check your emotions at the door, you buckle in and we're here to learn. But the reality is, is that neuroscience, contemporary neuroscience has done ama made amazing strides with regards to the role of emotion in learning. And two leading neuroscientists, Mary Helen Imorgino Yang, who actually used to be a teacher and Antonio Damasio um, wrote a, an article that really influenced my thinking. And this is a quote that I'd like to share with you. They write, Emotions are not just messy toddlers in a china shop running around breaking and obscuring delicate cognitive glassware. Instead, they're more like the shelves underlying the glassware. Without them, cognition has less support. That for me was kind of a, it pulled everything into perspective for me. Um, and it, it, the point here is that emotions don't just influence cognition. They are the ground floor of cognition. And what happens in the brain is, is you know, pretty compelling. Negative emotions trigger dramatic changes in our brain. The limbic system, which handles emotions and the cortex, which handles reason, they usually work together cooperatively as a person navigates different experiences. But during exposure to, to some kind of stressful situation, the amygdala, which is part of the limbic system, sends signals to other parts of the brain to release stress hormones. And this is referred to, you've probably heard the phrase, as an amygdala takeover. We all know what this feels like. When that happens, a person begins to experience physical changes, sweaty hands or neck, uh, faster heartbeat and breathing. They prepare these, these changes, these actual changes in your body prepare you to defend yourself or to run away 
which is something we know as fight or flight, right? So that's what's happening. These changes are good. They're good intentions anyway. They're what keep us safe in the face of danger. But all kinds of stressors trigger these bodily changes. High school reunion, a computer that suddenly stops working, um, starting a new course, starting at a new university. But there are influencers that worsen the stress and one of them is uncertainty. Not knowing where you're gonna sleep tonight. Not knowing where you're going to get your next meal or whether you'll be able to pay rent at the end of the month are all stressors that bring about these changes. And these are realities that more of our students are facing now more than ever. And existing in a prolonged stress state has been shown to decrease one's desire to socialize with others. It's also been shown to kill brain cells over time. And of course, derail one's ability to learn and remember. This is not a state in which a person can function at their full capacity. And if you'd like to learn more about this, I would just like to highlight a book that has been incredibly useful to me um, by Sia Versheldon. It's titled Bandwidth Recovery. Um, and uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out if anyone wants to dig deeper. So when we turn to our classes, our online classes, teaching remotely, um, um, there's so much to consider here. And we are not superheroes and we are also not counselors. Um, we have counselors, I'm speaking to the, the instructors in the room, counselors are the ones who are equipped to really support students with um, right, their, their emotional needs. Um, when I look at this quote, it was another moment where I started kind of thinking about the invisible things that happen in our classroom and asking myself, how can we be sure that we're supporting this? Um, these things. Uh, Megan Corrieri is a California Community College student who wrote an article for the team that I work for in the California Community College system. And you can read her article at the link below. Um, but this notion that like being required to turn on your webcam in a class and just having to shut it off for a minute so you can go have a good cry and come back and thinking about how to support that. There's a lot more going on. Um, that slide that I showed with the little bubbles uh, the, uh, you know, of the students and what, what they might be thinking as they come into a class, a lot of that has to do with the influence of stereotypes. And stereotypes don't only influence our students, they also influence us. They influence the way that we approach our teaching and the way that we uh, cue our students in our classes. So I, I think that it's really important to stress both sides of it. Um, Stereotype threat is when a person feels at risk for confirming a negative stereotype about their own identity. It's brought on by situations, negative stereotypes, um, and everyone, any, any person who, can, who identify, has part of their, identify, their identity that, is, that they associate with some kind of stereotype can be susceptible to stereotype threat. In higher education, negative stereotypes about intelligence are more likely to trigger stereotype threat in college students who are Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color, as well as women, particularly women of color in STEM courses. And um, there's a video on the slide. And by the way, I didn't share my slides with you. I'm sorry that I forgot to do that, but let me do that right now. Um, these slides are intended for you to be able to go back to and click through later uh, if you want to dig a little bit deeper. So this, it's not a long video, it's just a few minutes and I encourage you to watch it later if you want to learn a little bit more about stereotype threat, if it's new to you. I realize hmm, there's a lot of people who are very familiar with it already. But the consequences here, disengagement, underachievement on exams and other academic tasks and sudden course withdrawal. And I think a lot about things like online proctoring um, for our students who are Black, who am, grow up in a society in which they are in the suspicion of guilt and um, now surveillance becomes part of their assessment experience. There's certainly a stereotype threat component there. So what do we do about all of this? Um, there's a particular mindset that we really need to have 
to dig in and make these improvements. And in higher education in general, and I realize every, I, I'm really generalizing when I say this, but we are coming out of a paradigm of equality. And equality, in a paradigm of equality, we treat everyone the same because it's the fair thing to do. In a paradigm of equity, which is where we are now going, um, it's more about recognizing that everybody's not the same and that everybody needs something different. There are different things that people need to be able to achieve their full potential. And so some of our students need more support in this kind of social and emotional space. And that's a very, in my opinion, precious and important role that a teacher plays. Um, this quote here for me embodies an equity mindset. It, it, it really positions the need to shift away from looking at our students as the problem and really looking at what we're doing and thinking about what we can change to make things, to, to make improvements. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, this, the distinction between equality and equity, which I think is really important and taking this asset-based mindset towards what we're doing um, as opposed to a deficit-based mindset that points the finger at our students. And I also need to say points the finger at online classes. This narrative that online classes just aren't good enough is preventing us from doing better. So the question here becomes, if we think about um, you know, learning kind of being the outcome of emotion plus cognition, and we think about emotion as that ground floor, we wanna ask ourselves, how might we teach online in a way that supports the emotional well-being of our students and us, and I'm sorry, that part of it, I know I'm kind of leaving out here, but I need to acknowledge it. We started out thinking about us and we also need to take care of us because we have to take care of us to have room to take care of our students and to support them. So humanized online teaching, which is kind of this, this quote unquote model um, that has really kind of taken shape in the circles that, that I work in, in California, California Community College Systems over the past 15 plus years, there's been this kind of inquiry in asynchronous online courses to really understand um, how we can foster these human connections in an online class. And it's really become so, so fascinating to watch this evolve. Um, and to really point to instructor to student relationships as that connective tissue between students engagement and rigor. And I want to pause on that word rigor for a minute, because another thing we often hear when we introduce conversations like this one is um, this is just all about making it easy for students right. Um, we're just going to be I don't want to be a pushover that is not what this is about. There's a certain duality in this that you need to embrace. And in, in our culture, it, it's difficult to do that because it, we have a tendency to think that things are one way or another. So um, I think you'll understand what I mean by that when we move forward. I also wanna acknowledge that if anyone out there is already thinking, um, yeah, we know all of this about teaching, you're absolutely right. This is just about good teaching. The research behind this goes back decades. Uh, I'm going to point here to the work of Laura Rendon, which actually stems back to the 1990s, the work that she's done on validation theory that looks at um, um, first generation college students and uh, low income college students and asks them to really reflect back on their, their college experiences just about the time they're going to they, they graduate. She conducted interviews for research team. And that qualitative data, you know, they, they, in the interviews, they asked students to reflect back on their educational experiences and identify what it was that, that enabled them to shift from this, I don't think I can do this to I got this. And some of the things that came out in that research include when an instructor took time to learn my name, when an instructor said, you can do this and I'm going to help you. When an instructor became a partner in my learning. When faculty encouraged students to support one another. 
So we know this is the research, but what we don't see is that even instructors, from my experiences, my personal experiences working with faculty who are already doing this in their physical classroom, it doesn't always get transferred online. And that's what we're, that's why this presentation um, is going to focus specifically on online. And we also need to acknowledge that our educational system is not neutral. Uh, this is a quote from Zaretta Hammond's book, which I also strongly recommend, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain. Classroom studies have documented the fact that underserved English learners, poor students, and students of color routinely receive less instruction in higher order skills development than other students. What that does is it denies students the opportunity to engage in what neuroscientists call productive struggle that actually grows our brain power. And as a result, a disproportionate number of culturally and linguistically diverse students enter our college classes as dependent learners. So let's look a little bit about what that, whoops, about what that means. Um, I have these, uh, this, the point here at the bottom about executive functioning skills because the executive functioning skills are also what get derailed in those moments of stress and trauma that we thought about earlier. A dependent learner is unsure about how to tackle a new task, needs scaffolds to complete tasks, and will sit passively and wait if stuck until the teacher intervenes. The independent learner possesses cognitive strategies for getting unstuck, attempts new tasks without scaffolds, and has learned how to retrieve information from long-term memory. This slide falsely presents these two as a dichotomy. Um, this is a continuum. And so people all begin as dependent learners, and it's through that intellectual struggle that we, it, that we develop the skills to become independent learners. We have all students across that spectrum in your class. And the work of, um, yeah, sorry about that. Just lost my train of thought there for a second. Um, what we wanna do is employ teaching strategies and techniques that enable us to move our students from being a dependent learner to an independent learner. So how do we do that? Culturally responsive teaching, culturally responsive teaching has the key there. Um, within the research of culturally responsive teaching, there's this approach, this pedagogical approach called being a warm demander. And um, I'm just gonna go through some of the characteristics of a warm demander. What, what a warm demander does is that it, um, it's a type of teaching that develops intellectual abilities in independent learners. Rigor derives through empathy. What that means is that when a student knows there's someone on the other side of that screen who's there for them, who's in it with them, and who believes in them, they are going to lean in and challenge themselves. It requires personal warmth as opposed to professional distance, which we need to be much more intentional about in online classes because our presence is not there unless we construct it, right? Particularly asynchronous online courses. There is intentional focus at the start of the term on positive instructor to student and student-student relationships. It starts with that. So again, going back to this notion of human connection as an antidote. An instructor partakes in active demanding as opposed to passive understanding after rapport is established. So it's about reaching out. Um, it's about reaching out intrusively, following up with students, inquiring if everything is okay, pulling them into the learning environments instead of just sitting back and letting them fall off the radar, right? And a warm demander affirms effort and ability in their interactions, in the feedback, which is a huge part of this feedback, feedback, feedback. I know you can do this. Look what you just did. You're so smart. I believe in you. These things matter. 
But when we go to the research about online courses, and this is a research study that came out in 2016 um, that actually looked at online community college students, which serve, which do comprise the most diverse group of, of students. The study looked at what course design features influence student performance the most. And the number one feature, interestingly, was quality instructor to student interactions, which I would argue is actually not course design, that's teaching. So that's an, a conversation also, a very fascinating conversation to talk about how course design and teaching are two sides of the same coin and we, we need to look at both sides. And if you're wondering how quality was determined in the student data, um, it was, a, it was related to the sense of having someone on the other side of the screen who cared about them. But that same study also acknowledged that this is not the norm for students. This is not the type of online experience that most online students have. They're more likely to feel disengaged. They're more likely to feel left out. Um, and they're also more likely to experience um, or another phrase that surfaced in the data was the need to teach myself. That was another theme that came up. I'm going to play a video now that I'd just like you to watch. It's super brief. And um, if you can't read the white on white text that I left for you at the top of the screen, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to identify how the student feels. And I'd like you to enter that into the chat. I can see that a professor isn't trying to interact with the course. And I, it's just little things like, the automatic announcements that only show up at 12 a.m. on a Sunday. Like, you know it's all uh, automated. They're just not, or you leave a question and ask the <coughs> professor and three weeks later you get a response. Like, that's when I start to judge. Like, I just wish you wouldn't be here. Like, I wish you would focus your energy somewhere else because I'm not learning anything. But yeah, so that's the only judgment is when you're not doing anything. We don't care when you make mistakes though. So in the chat, how does the student feel? Ignored, frustrated, disrespected, not satisfied, unimportant, left out, invisible, not valued, disenfranchised, frustrated, of course, cheated, yeah, not being taught, unengaged. Okay, so um, we can think about <laughs> those adjectives and also recognize that that's not a state that's going to motivate a person. When a human doesn't feel important, when a human doesn't feel seen, there's very little motivation to get excited and to lean into something and do your best. That's true across the board, okay? Um, and we can kind of start to unpack like maybe what was going on in this class and there's very little we know really. Uh, because there isn't a whole lot of information that was provided in that clip other than the way he was feeling. But as one person noted in the chat, he did talk about that announcement, right? That automated announcement. And it's interesting, he said something to the effect of, if that's all you're doing is, you know, sending an announcement that deploys every Sunday at 12 a.m., students can see through that stuff pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and I also want to say that I don't think automated announcements are a bad thing. I forget all kinds of stuff, especially today when our, you know, with, with all the stuff that we have going on. And um, it's important that we can actually use time-saving strategies to be sure we get important information out to students when they need it. That's great. But if that's it, if that's the only presence, then that's not great. And that's not going to lead to I can um, see that a professor a positive engaging experience. So we're going to watch one more video now and we're going to then um, think a little bit about what the instructor did to create this experience for the student. I feel that when the instructor assigns or gives us um, a, a due date, I feel that we need to be um, cognizant of that, respectful of that, and do our very best to, to get it done. However, there's the juxtaposition there is that we are taking online classes because we have life outside of the classroom. So the very reason that we are taking this um, communicates what we expect. The things happen. So being able to have that connection with your instructor and, and obviously be reasonable. Um, for me, I, I was traveling a lot. Um, 
to see my mother-in-law who wasn't well and we were getting stuck in airports and I was, I mean, I carry my desk everywhere with me, my little laptop and everything. And um, I also suffered, um, I had an accident where I suffered a TBI. Um, I got in line and I'm going to give her a big shout out. Cindy Wilhelson from Costa College. I'm, I'm having a trouble here. I'm in Florida. I can't get to the pharmacy. So, and she just pushed it out a few days. I was able to breathe. I was able to um, get my work done. I'm going to cry. And I, that self-confidence came back. The, um, I did well. And um, I was so appreciative of that function. Very often I haven't seen it in a face-to-face -face class. Here's the due date. So let's stop there and tell me what this instructor did to create a successful, I would paraphrase this as a successful experience for the student. Flexibility, empathy, circumstantial effort to accommodate compassion, gave grace, flexible and empathetic. She cared. Yeah, flexible is, is rising to the top, responded to the individual needs of the student, made an exception when needed. They did not forget that students are people, understanding that life happens, listened, and of course, to be able to do all of that, you need to know what's happening in your students' lives, right? They need, we need to have the context set up so that students feel comfortable coming to us. That's a big part of this. So I'm going to transition now, now that we've kind of looked at those two different ends of the spectrum and, and thought a little bit about what we can do. Um, I want, this, is, this, part, this slide is really important, and I know it's kind of weird to see a picture of soup. Um, right now, but I want to both be critical about the notion of best practices, which I know ironically is the name of the, the book that I wrote a few years ago, but I wanna be critical about it as I showcase these practices, these ideas. Um, I'm a big believer based on my experiences that when faculty teach online, they need to see examples so that they can take those examples, and this is true in the classroom too, it's not just online, but I think particularly online because a lot of times we ourselves have never been a student in an online class that conveys empathy, right? That we felt like someone cares on the other slide, side. And so we need to see particular strategies. So when I share these, I want you to think about these as like the carrots you're gonna put in your soup. And when you put carrots in your soup and you boil it, um, you know, you, you mix it up and they kind of fall apart and they turn into some other shape, other texture. You can also think about them as maybe like the basil that you're going to put in your soup, because if you're someone who's already, who's already doing things and maybe just want to sprinkle some, some, some other strategies or ideas on top. So take it, take these for what they're worth. Um, you are the teaching experts. And I just, it's just very important for me to say that. So what we know from the research, um, is that the start of an online class is really kind of a high opportunity zone. Uh, we know that our students of color in, particularly, uh, in particular are more likely to experience something called belonging uncertainty. And that happens more heavily. It's, it's, it's emphasized more at the start of a class or a new social situation, right? Um, and there's a, a, an article, the work by Mika Estrada, who's cited at the bottom of the slide, who's looking at using things that she refers to as affirming kindness cues to increase social inclusion. And I think about that as these strategies. I think the strategies that we use in humanizing can really be thought of as kindness cues of social inclusion. And thinking about how we can bring those into week zero and one of a course is particularly important. So there are eight strategies. Um, I'm gonna emphasize some more than others as I go through them here with you. Uh, and again, this chart simply shows you, you know, a suggestion about how we can think about each one of these eight strategies as a type of kindness cue that we are intentionally weaving into a student's experience from the very first click. The first one is a liquid syllabus and I'm gonna play a brief video to introduce you to this idea. I know what you're thinking. I have a syllabus and I've worked really hard on it. 
So why should I take the time to also create a liquid syllabus? And what does that mean anyway? After all, I already have my syllabus online in the form of a PDF. And I know all my students can access it in Canvas. But folks, the thing is, when your syllabus is behind a login screen, it may be tough for students to get to it from their phone. And no matter how lovely it looks on a computer, reading it on a mobile device is tough. The information in that syllabus is important, right? The bottom line is when we use tools designed for print products, they don't result in mobile friendly experiences. And that's not good for our students. How might things change if you used a website tool like Google Sites or WordPress to create a liquid version of your syllabus? For just a moment, imagine being a student it's the start of your first semester in college and the week before class starts. You check your email and you get a friendly welcome message from your sociology instructor. It includes a button at the bottom to check the syllabus. You tap that button with your finger and instantly you go to a syllabus that's easy to read and experience with the swipe of your finger. And you also discover something pretty special at the top. Hi scholars, my name is Katie Whitman Conklin and I'm going to be your instructor this semester. A little bit about me, I lived in the Central Valley of California for a lot of years with my husband and children while he was stationed there with the Navy. And when he retired, we moved to Northern Idaho where we now live with our kids on a family ranch. You think to yourself, hey, I'm gonna love this class. I can't wait to get started. But you know what? That's not the only benefit of a liquid syllabus. Since it lives on the web, it's shareable with a simple link. That means you can place that link in as many other places as you'd like. How about adding it next to your course description in your college's class schedule? Or on your profile page on your college website? Or a link on your own professional website? And you know what can really help promote your course and encourage more students to enroll? That's right share it on Twitter. When we design with web tools, we create mobile friendly content that supports our students in so many ways. It also lets them know we care. Um, it's interesting, Laura, that I, I, we got to this point, right, as you were, you were talking about um, sharing and kind of getting, you know, removing, unlocking learning, we'll say. Um, the, the liquid syllabus kind of picks up on that. And again, thinking about the first click of a student's experience and removing barriers, right? Equity is about removing barriers and something like a login screen can be a barrier for students who have never taken a class before. I've seen it in both of my kids now that are now entering college. Um, these little things really derail students. And so if we can reach out to students before a course starts and share something like this concept of the liquid syllabus um, that I want to take you through a little bit more that is easy to access and mobile friendly because we know that our students are more likely to access content or email um, from a phone. Uh, it, it might be something that could really make a difference. And then what we put in that liquid syllabus is really important. So it has to be accessible, um, phone friendly. We've already stated that. And using a website tool enables us to really create content that is responsive, but also to embed that video at the top so that your smiling face is something that they see upon the first click. Um, so some of the things that you'll find in a liquid syllabus, and I'm just gonna go out to my example. I've got some other examples um, in, on that previous slide. This is the welcome video here for me that you're welcome to watch. But what I want to point out here is that this really doesn't get into the syllabusy type of stuff. <laughs> it doesn't get into the policies and all of that stuff, okay? But I want to address that in a minute. This is really about guiding the students to, to want to come into the class, to feel comfortable, to feel welcomed, and to know that I am in this with them. So I'm setting myself up. I'm really conveying to them that I'm going to be a partner in their, their learning. I'm demystifying how the class works. I have my teaching philosophy that really stresses that diversity to me is an asset in our learning environment. 
I've got a video of myself making Chipino and making an analogy between all the diversity, the different flavors and textures that go into my Chipino. That's what makes it so delicious and making it, drawing it, an analogy to, to our online class. They're seeing me in my kitchen. So I'm kind of taking myself off that pedestal and positioning myself as a real person. There's a blooper at the end with my son in it. Um, our pact. I set up what, what students can expect from me and what I will expect from you. And at the bottom, I give them an opportunity. Number eight, you'll see it says, do you wanna add something to this list? So once they're in the class, they see this again and they actually have the opportunity to add something or simply agree to the path the way it is. And I have a success kit. In the success kit, I lay out a suggested plan for week one. For students who don't understand what it means to learn asynchronously, they can follow this. And Saturday and Sundays, I have in here, or take a break if you've already gotten this part done. So really stressing the importance to take a break. Um, that's, that's one of the ways that we really need to take care of ourselves. And then the beauty of a website is that what you, what you can do is actually go into edit mode and I can enable different pages that are hidden. So after the class starts, I can turn on all of these other pages and make them available to the students. And they, it's still the same link that they have access to. So that's a little bit about the liquid syllabus. I have an example of a learning pact here that you're welcome to adapt. This is shared in the public domain. Um, and Janelle, you're asking about Canvas. It, you can use Canvas. Um, it seems that I'm getting the sense that as an institution, you have perhaps have a culture of, of using public pages. You can use Canvas. I prefer Google Sites. I think it's, I think it's more visually appealing, um, but it, that would be a personal choice. If you were to use Canvas and, and use, use the feature to open up your course and make that available, then that would function the same way, yes. And then your, your home page. Um, again, thinking about the next click, embedding a video on your home page that actually helps students understand what they're supposed to do from here. In this video, I point out to students to make note of, um, to make note of, I'm so sorry, folks, the, um, the to-do list and the calendar, how to, how to find those things. And if they're not familiar with Canvas, don't make that assumption that students know how to navigate all those things. Sometimes it's not until the second year that students figure that stuff out. And I want them to know that now. Um, and then using brief and perfect videos to really kind of give students different study skills. I'm gonna play, <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to scrap Google Slides after this one. I'm going to eat this whole watermelon. Sound like a bad idea? Well, it is if I do it all at once, but if I cut it up into chunks and eat a bowl every day, it's gonna be gone in a week. And that's why watermelons are like the modules in our course. Your brain is a lot like your stomach. It works better when it processes things in smaller frequent amounts. So weaving in study skills like that, I have a series called um, I... Let's Get Real, and I'm sprinkling those videos in throughout my class. Um, and Judy, I want to I want to let you know that I see you. Your question about feeling reluctant. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, everybody feels reluctant, and I recognize that everybody has different reasons for feeling reluctant. So this is, you know, your journey. Um, I, what we do is that we invite faculty into a supportive place and encourage them to experiment with videos. And what we find is once they make one and really kind of master the workflow, it gets easier and they start to feel more comfortable with it. So um, there's a lot of vulnerability that comes in there and vulnerability for particularly for a college instructor is, is not a comfortable place. So I completely recognize that. Um, uh, a getting to know you survey. I want to know how I can support you. That's the cue that you send. Ask your students, what are your pronouns? If that's not a field in your Canvas um, students um, settings, which it might be, I'm not sure. Let your students know that you will leave them feedback in video format or in voice format and ask them how that works for them. 
That way we're checking, you know, at, being sure that students have the opportunity to say that that's not going to work for me because it's not going to work for all students for different kinds of reasons, in, um, including disabilities, right? So give them that option there. And in one word, how are you feeling about this class? What this survey enables you to do, um, customizing it, you know, thinking about what else you need to collect from your students. But these last two questions here to me are really, really helpful for identifying your high opportunity students, the ones that need your human connection the most. When you say in one word, how are you feeling about this class? You're gonna pan through those answers and you're gonna see fine, um, excited, you're gonna see overwhelmed, anxious, and for, with this last question, share one thing that may interfere with your success in the class, that's when you're gonna to start to understand what's happening on your student's side, on the, side, on the other side of the screen with your students' lives. Um, there's a note column in Canvas that I strongly encourage you to, to think about using if you don't already, turn on that notes column in the grade book and take notes about the students, what you learn about them reach out to them before it's too late and record voice and video feedback in the grade book for your high opportunity students. When students can hear your feedback and have an opportunity to see your nonverbal communication cues, the messages are received differently. And there's, there's research that backs that up. When you start a course, being sure that there are opportunities for students to bring in things from their lives that they feel good about and talk about them. Create prompts, for example, an icebreaker prompt that allows students the opportunity to connect on a social level and you need to be in that with them. This is a beautiful prompt that my colleague uh, Fabio Latorres from Glendale Community College uses in her class now during COVID. Back in 1990, when I was in high school, I loved to dance. Today, I still dance by myself in my house. And that video there again is her icebreaker, inviting students in to share something that they still do, um, inviting them to, to share a video if they want or type their response, giving them choices. Uh, but really, you know, getting just talking about things that you feel good about with yourself that also sends cue, the cue to your students that their experiences are gonna play a role in this class, they matter. Another prompt um, that a colleague of mine, Denise Maduli Williams uses, she asks students, what will you hold on to in life? What's important to you? Share something. And she uses Flipgrid for this icebreaker. So the students are using video, but in the video, they're actually holding something up and sharing something with their peers. And they're talking about that thing, right? Which really kind of takes the pressure off of them. So that's kind of a, another very helpful strategy. You can start to see all the diversity and the cultural differences that come out in um, those objects, actually. So, again, targeting these um, elements in week zero to one, that high opportunity zone, and then adapting your teaching as you move forward to really support those high opportunity students that you have seen. And that's where we can start to employ that warm demand or pedagogy with the students that you particularly know need it the most, or I should say will benefit from it the most. Um, the wisdom wall assignment is uh, one that can be adapted in lots of different ways. If, if um, I were going to employ this assignment in my class for the first time, here's how I would do it. I would wait until the end of my class. I would ask my students to, uh, to think back to the start of my class and reflect back on what they've learned since then reflect back on what they are what they were feeling at the beginning of the term and share one piece of advice for the next group of students coming in so by doing that students are stepping into the role of expert they're engaging in metacognition uh, it's starting to help them to see learning as a growth process and it 
really starts to foster self-efficacy in their skill in the, in themselves as they're speaking, literally speaking. If we use a tool like VoiceThread or Flipgrid or um, so, you know, recording audio inside of Canvas. Um, so that can be adapted. Oh, and then we take that and share it with the, the next group of students coming in. So my liquid syllabus, I'm getting ready to actually put my wisdom wall in my liquid syllabus. So it will have a, a spot to live there as well. So students can see that before the class starts and students share the best advice you could imagine. And then the last two examples have to do with instructional video. Um, and essentially they're a bumper video and a micro lecture which really kind of fall into a similar group but a bumper video is intended to be two to three minutes max and it it encourages you as an instructor to think about your course the way you have it designed and you know where those bumps are you know where those sticky spots are you know what the the topics are that are going to trip students up so take that topic and turn it into a two to three minute video set to music with visual icons. Uh, we have faculty in our humanizing online teaching and learning course. We encourage them to check out Adobe Spark if they're new to video, it's a free tool. Um, and if you are feeling reluctant about showing yourself on video, I'm a huge fan of Adobe Spark. Um, Adobe Spark allows for you to create a voice narrative over a visual uh, track using images and icons and text. So that's a great place to start. And I have an example here that you can check out later from Matt Mooney. Um, micro lecture, just a little bit longer, but using the same instructional strategies, right? Thinking about a topic, a specific topic and ensuring that those, um, those videos are really anchored to them. So instead of creating an hour long video really chunking it down so each video is aligned with a specific outcome uh, which which takes preparation um, but think about that if you haven't before start thinking about that as you are doing longer videos maybe and you'll start to understand kind of how you can delineate that longer segment into smaller chunks that makes the content much more accessible for students because it allows them to go back and revisit much easier. So those are, are our eight humanized online teaching elements. I have an infographic that I uh, warmly invite you to explore. Uh, it has all of the, the, um, the references at the bottom and it also has many links to examples within it, some of which you saw here today, some of which you didn't. Uh, but these are all buttons where you can dig a little bit deeper into the different practices. And I want to leave with the, the notion of vulnerability, which has come up several times. There's lots of reasons why we feel vulnerable. Um, and I myself, I'm not going to try to step into your lives and understand what's going on there. Um, but we do know that human nature let me, let me start again. We do know that vulnerability is emotional risk and exposure. Um, I'm riffing now off of the work of Brene Brown, who's done a lot of research in this space. And her work also shows that it's the, it's the core of meaningful human experience. We can't have human connection until we are willing to be vulnerable. It is where innovation begins. And what I find is that we, what I find is that college courses often have the expectation for students to be vulnerable, have the expectation for students to do things that they don't feel comfortable doing, to reach out and ask for help when they may not feel like it's safe for them to do that because of their past traumas and experiences that they're bringing into the classroom. So that's what I think about. Um, we also know that vulnerability may feel like weakness but it looks like courage to other people. So I hope that that is something you will keep with you as you move forward um, with your new term. And I'm gonna stop sharing. And again, apologize for my jumpy Google slides and see what's going on in the chat. I know we're at time. So Keegan, I'm gonna let you kind of navigate that. <laughs> 
Yeah, we have uh, we have a few minutes before the next session. Um, so if there are a couple of comments that you want to uh, mention with some of the uh, information and questions in the chat, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, the next session does start at 1.15, so there's still a few minutes if, uh, if that's a focus you want to do. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you recall in the chat that is a question I could respond to, or do you just want me to? Uh, let me scroll up real quick. And seeing comments about emotional burden. Um, Keisha's responding to Aletha. I'm not sure if I said Alethea's question about balance. There's a tendency already for students to want. Okay, so hold on. Let me move back here. Yeah. Okay, so. And I'm, I, I apologize if I'm saying your name incorrectly, Alethea. Uh, thank you for raising that. The aspects of our identity influence um, how we feel, right? So we talked about um, racism, of course, um, sexism plays a big role, particularly um, in higher education where um, our domain is very male dominated and the types of characteristics that we may be expected to model are very um, male dominated. And that is something that definitely needs to be acknowledged. Um, there's an article by Jessamine Newhouse that came out a couple of months ago called Embodied, something embodied, can't remember the name of it. I tell you what, I'll find it and I'll add it to my website. Um, but she really, she does a fabulous job of acknowledging all of this and points out that, and she uses humanizing as an example. When we're recording videos, we're not just recording videos, right? We are having to really process a lot. Um, so um, I, I think that we are confronting the same types of, of biases that we confront in the classroom. And what I find, I think this is perhaps something that's very important to say, is that the more we create a learning environment online where students see each other as real people, and understand each other as real people with real experiences and they understand you the same way, it diffuses problems. It diffuses um, flare-ups. It kind of is, right, um, the opposite of dehumanization when we start to not see people as objects but as real people with experiences. We, that's when we start to have these connections and we start to develop community. So um, it is my intent to suggest that these practices, as well as keeping them moving as you go forward in your class, not just saying, check those boxes, I did it, but being present and reaching out and being empathetic will diffuse some of that. So thank you. Thank you, Laura. There is the, um, the article from Jessamine Newhouse. She has just put it in the um, chat or her website anyway. Thank you. Thank you so, oh. yes, okay. Well, awesome. Um, uh, thank you, Michelle, so much for joining us today. Um, I see love is being shared in the, the chat as well. So everybody, in addition to, you know, your visual applause can, can share love in the chat as well. Um, but we thank you so much for being here um, and giving this talk. Thank you very much. I am going to actually save the chat so I can go through and read it light later. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Thank you so much. Sounds good. Have a good day.